said, because I obtained help from the Lord, I remain until this day. Because I obtained help from the Lord, I remain to this day. Somebody celebrate the love of our Christ. Celebrate the fact that he is a present help in our time of need. I don't know where I would be or what I would do without God having helped me. Hallelujah. I know, I know you think you've done it. You, you think you're that good. But there are those of us who understand that we are who and what we are because of the goodness of our God. Come on, celebrate that again. Well, good morning, KIGM. Good morning to all of our guests, our visitors. If you're visiting, just wave your hand. We'd like to see where you are. God bless. God bless. It's uh, a pleasure. We have uh, the brother of our mayor, Coven, Michael Coven. He's with us this morning in worship. And brother Michael is running for the North Carolina House number 42 in the area of Spring Lake, Hollywood Heights, and Fayetteville. And needless to say, we need people leading this country who have a relationship with Christ. I can't tell you who to vote for, how to vote, but I can tell you that this is a time and season where we really need to pray and then do what we need to do from the privilege we've been given to vote. So we bless God again for your presence, brother Michael Colvin. Thank you. Praise the Lord. Come on, let's give it up again for our Love Day ministry. Expressions of love. They are just absolutely wonderful. Elder Wilson, thank you for leading this ministry for all these years. And each year has gotten better and better. We bless the Lord for our intercessory prayer group. They're usually on the door and ushering. You know, some of us, we just kind of keep to what it is that we think is our specialty. But it's wonderful when you have people who mature and they'll just do whatever they need to do because they love. God bless you. Thank you, Intercessory Prayer Group. Amen. Praise our God. You may be seated a few Sundays back. In fact, two Sundays back, we, <clears throat> we celebrated our Vision Day. We celebrated with a wonderful worship and with our seed sowing. And we just want to remind you, we really believe, there are those of us who really believe that we're going to live to see that second phase. Amen. But it's not just going to happen. It'll involve sowing. Amen. And every seed counts. So we want to encourage you, if you hadn't, sown that seed, please do so. We have to understand that vision is the inheritance of generations to come. What we're doing now is supposed to make the inheritance for generations to come, we're supposed to make things better for them. Amen. Uh, whatever I am as a senior leader, I should make it easier for the next senior leader. Amen? As believers, before we leave the earth, we should make whatever it is we do better 
for the person who's coming after us. Can y'all say amen to that? Well, it's time for the ministry of the word. If you're able to stand, please do. I want to share with you the message titled, Love, the Power to Impact. Love, the Power to Impact. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 22, beginning at verse 37, and I'll read down to verse 39. And I'm reading from the Amplified Classic version of the text. And he replied to him, meaning Jesus, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, intellect. This is the great, most important principle and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. You may be seated. Love, the power to impact. I want to begin by having us look at Romans chapter 12, verse 3 where it reads, for by the grace unmerited favor of God given to me, I warn everyone among you not to estimate and think of himself more highly than he ought, not to have an exaggerated opinion of his own importance, but to rate his ability with sober judgment, each according to the degree of faith <clears throat> by which God has given him are apportioned by God to him. Last Sunday, we learned that impact is the action of one object coming forcefully into contact with another or coming into forcible contact with another. Love is the greatest force known to mankind. Jesus described it this way in John's gospel, chapter 15 and verse 13. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Jesus says there's no love greater than one that is sacrificial, not self-sufficient, but self-sacrificing. So when we talk about the power of love to impact, we are talking about the ability to love and the legal right to act it out. Because the love of God has been shared abroad in our hearts, notice, through the Holy Spirit, which was given unto us. We are absolutely, in our natural way of loving, incapable of agape love. We must give ourselves to Holy Spirit, allowing Holy Spirit to express the Father's love through us. You know, our human way of defining love is usually based on how it makes us feel. We define love from a very selfish standpoint, and that's why we must take an in-depth, deeper look at ourselves. And we can do that by looking at 2 Timothy 2.15, where Paul commands, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth. You know, it's possible for me to impact others in a positive way or to impact them in a very negative way. And this is why the command is, uh, as Paul puts it, that I am to study not just the scriptures to gain knowledge and insight of them, 
but I am to study myself in contrast to the word so that I can make sure my life is lining up with the word of God. And when I study myself in contrast to the word of God, I'll have no need to be a workman who is ashamed. Why? Because I will have God's perspective of myself and his perspective of others and I'll be able to rightly divide what is true from what is not. The word study that Paul uses in this passage, it implies a hasty look or an intense study because by nature we humans are selfish. So according to Romans 12, 3, what I think about myself should line up with the word of God. It's what Paul calls sober thinking. When our thinking lines up with God's word, it is compared to being sober. So Paul is telling us here in Romans 12, 3, how we ought to think about ourselves. It's a natural thing for us to love ourselves. And that's why the Bible instructs us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves because supposedly you should know how to love yourself. I saw something while preparing this message in 1 Peter uh, 122 that I think we need to look at. And it's coming from the Amplified Classic. It says, since by your obedience to the truth through the Holy Spirit, you have purified your hearts for sincere affection of the brethren. See that you love one another fervently from a pure heart. Why would God exalt saints who are already loving one another to love one another? The answer is found in the fact that the first word love mentioned in the passage comes from a Greek word referring to one kind of love and then the second word love is from another word that's talking about a different kind of love. The first word love that the writer calls unfeigned love of the brethren is a love that brings pleasure. It's one that is self-gratifying. This kind of love is when you love someone because you like them. Because you get pleasure from having them around and they get pleasure by being around you. This form of love is the response of the human spirit to what appeals uh, to it as pleasurable. It's, it's a reciprocal love. I bring you pleasure and you bring me pleasure and because we receive one another's pleasure we love one another. It's when we love one another because we like one another. We have things in common. This kind of love, whenever it's given pleasure, it gives affection. You know those people who love their friends and no one outside of that? The Amplified Version calls it sincere affection of the brethren while the King James Version calls it unfeigned love of the brethren. It's because you like the person that you love them and have affection for them. It's a friendship love or a friendly affection. It's where each saint finds in the heart of the other saint that which affords him pleasure. I've heard believers say I don't like him. I don't like her. And because they don't like them, they don't draw near. See, sometimes we've got to realize that <laughs> the way we love is a reflection of our likes and our dislikes. Oh yeah, this is the right word. Uh -huh. Sometimes we love because we have the same interest. We like the same thing. Amen. But, but don't, don't get the wrong idea. This kind of love is a perfectly proper and legitimate love. Uh, the only problem with it is that 
it has no self-sacrifice in it. See, to love somebody you like isn't difficult. Because you don't have to sacrifice to love somebody you like or somebody who's been around them gives you pleasure. The danger of this kind of love is that it can be reduced to something selfish and self-centered. One saint may find so much in another saint that gratifies his desire for fellowship that he does not think of the other person but merely of himself and of his own welfare. So, so what started out as a mutual friendly love can become a selfish, self-centered fulfillment. The second use of the word love is from another Greek word. This love springs from a sense of value of the person who is being loved. Underline it. Underline it. This kind of love comes from the value. The value. Not because you like them, but because you place value. Oh, I'm preaching the right word. It is a love that places esteem and value and preciousness on the person that is being loved. This love is where you prize the other person and you see their worth as God sees it. You place the same value on them as God has placed upon them. You see their worth as God sees their worth. This love reflects the response of the heart of God and how precious God sees each individual. Aren't you thankful that God does not look at you as others look at you? He doesn't see you as they see you. And yet he knows everything there is to know about you. He knows your weaknesses and he knows your frailties and he knows your sins and your secret, I mean your secret stuff. And yet he loves you because he placed a worth and a value on you. God doesn't love you based on what you do or do not do. He loves you because he just, he's the nature of love. Yeah. God sees you and I as precious. Precious because he created in us his image. And second, because you and I have the same nature of God in us. This love is a self-sacrificial love because of the preciousness of the saint who is being loved. This love sacrifices for the blessing of, of others. It is a love that suffers long, a love that is kind, a love that does not envy, a love that is not puffed up, a love that does not behave itself unseemingly, a love that does not seek its own, a love that is not provoked, a love that thinks no evil, a love that does not rejoice in iniquity, but rather in the truth, a love that bears, believes, hopes, and endures all things, a love that never fails. Somebody holler unconditional. When God created Adam, he also created Eve because if not for the rest of Adam's life, he would, would have been self-centered. Why? Because there would have had, there would have not been anyone to consider but himself. Have you ever thought about it? God gave him a wife because he needed a wife, but he also gave him a wife because he needed to learn how to not be selfish. If Adam is going to be like God, there had to be someone else around so that he could direct love away from himself. See, love is not love until you give it away. Self-love can become pride. And this is why Jesus came. He came to reverse the natural order of things. He came to reverse this natural order of self-centeredness. Yet, he wants you to realize that if you can love others like you love yourself, then you'll be directing that love away from you towards somebody else. The truth is, we tend to love ourselves more than we even love God. 
Therefore, we're incapable of loving others. Love is a seed. You demand a greater love to come over you that couldn't come until you released it away from you. Love is not powerful until you release it. It doesn't reproduce until you give it away. You can talk about it all you want. But until you sow it, there'll be no return. And, and you talk about folk not loving you. Could it be because you're not a sower of love? Could it be that you reap what you, what you sow? Could it be that people aren't nice to you because you're not nice to others? Could it be that people doesn't go out of the way to help you because you don't go out of the way to help anyone? Oh, I'm preaching better than you're responding. Love is a seed. And if it's a seed, you have to give it away for it to reproduce. In Ephesians 5, 28, Paul teaches, listen husbands, that husbands are to love their wives as they love themselves. Men, we are instructed to love our wives. To what degree? Paul says, as you love your own bodies. Why would God want me to love my wife as I love my own body? Verse 28 answers that question. It says, he that loveth his wife loveth himself. So God is saying, husbands, love your wives like you love your own body. Because if you can love your wife, that is the proof that you love yourself. But, but look at the next verse, verse 29. For no man yet hated his own flesh, but he nourishes it and cherishes, cherishes it and protects it. Even as the Lord does the church. This is naturally true. Naturally, you naturally you might not even like yourself, but you're going to eat when you're hungry. It's a natural tendency for you to love yourself. By nature, you're not going to let your body on purpose get hurt. You're going to protect it. You're going to nourish it, and you're going to cherish it. That's why you see folks out walking all the time and exercising. Because we love our bodies. Okay? If our love for others is reflected in how we love ourselves, this could be the reason why we oftentimes are caught in a snare of conditional love. In other words, when you only love yourself, when you feel good about your achievements, your looks, your good deeds, your anything that's based on conditions and that's how you love others when God so loved the world and gave his only begotten to die for it he never put a condition on his love he never defined his love because when we put a condition on love when we define love and then conditions change or how we defined it is no longer the same then we stop loving and this is why you have to draw from God's ability to love yourself and others. You must draw from his ability and learn to love yourself through his filter. Help me say this. Just put it into the atmosphere. We cannot duplicate what we cannot comprehend. We cannot duplicate a love that we do not comprehend. I don't, I don't know about you. I love the Lord, I think. I mean, the best I know. Mm -hmm. But the one thing that I, I, I challenge myself with daily is that there are times I don't comprehend God's unconditional love. Especially, now I love it. When it comes from him to me. I don't understand it when, it when he directs it from me to others. I'm going to say it again. I'm preaching better than you guys are responding. 
I love God and I love the way he loves when he's loving on me. But I'm not sure I comprehend that kind of love when he commands me to give it away. And especially to folks I know don't like me. To folk I know don't favor me. It's easy to love folk who reciprocate. But the love of God goes beyond love coming to me. The greatest love is when I can grasp that I'm anointed to love others through him. There's no way we can duplicate on our own the love of God. Holy Spirit has to, he has to work that love through me. But then even so, I have to make my heart available. He doesn't make me love. Oh, I'm going to preach this. Please tell somebody, love is not a feeling. It's a decision. It's where you decide that you love. Has nothing to do with how you feel or even how others feel about you. It's a decision because God loved me. I need to find somebody that I give his love to through me man without the power of the Holy Spirit we are unable to relate to the unconditional love of God our Father I mean while they're crucifying him he cries out Father Forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I, I don't pray them kind of prayers. I'm going to tell y'all right now. I don't pray them kind of prayers. My prayer is God, you know they know what they do. God, you know they did that intentionally. God, you know they did that on purpose. I need you to deal with them. That's, my, that's the way I pray. Yeah, that's the way I pray. God, they mess with me, and your word said, touch not. Now, Lord, I'm yours. They mess with me. Now I need you to mess with them. I'm just saying that's how that's how I think about it. I'm not saying it's right, but I am telling the truth. The word of God says if you can love your wife like you love your own body and if you can love your neighbor like you love yourself, you will consider them the same as you consider yourself. Because naturally most people take great consideration for their bodies and for themselves. We spend a lot of money and time going to the doctor taking care of our body. The word says, if you can love your wife and love your neighbor like you love yourself, you will consider them like you consider yourself. The instant Adam disobeyed God, mankind gave birth to the nature of selfishness. All men since that time are born with the nature to be self-centered. With a nature to be self-conscious. With a nature of self-gratification. With a nature to be self-reliant, self-indulgent, and self-conceited. Since the fall of Adam, we are born with the inability to deny self. And without the power of Holy Spirit, mankind cannot relate to self-denial. Because it's natural for us to consider ourselves first. You were born with a self-centered tendency to love yourself without anybody having to teach you how to do it. As soon as a baby is born and it's hungry, it doesn't check the clock to see if it's three 
o'clock in the morning, it cries and cries until somebody comes in and feeds it. And that baby will cry more intensely until its body is taken care of. So you're born with a natural tendency to love yourself and to consider yourself. And if you don't have a relationship with God where your mind is being renewed as you grow older, the tendency progresses. And there is no individual like an old self-centered one. Uh-huh. Philippians 2.21 says, For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. This verse tells me that the natural tendency I was born with to seek my own or to love myself is not something that is of Christ. The nature of Christ doesn't seek his own. When God breathed into Adam's nostrils and he became a living soul, God breathed into him what the Greeks call Zoe. Zoe is the God kind of life. It is the nature in essence of God. God literally put his nature in his essence into a lifeless corpse. And it came alive with the life that God gave him. God gave it himself. God gave Adam himself. The nature of love. It was God's essence that caused Adam to live. Uh oh. Could it be that, that you and I cannot live outside of the essence of God? Mm hmm. We better learn because we go around thinking that we're going to make people love us. Who is that girl that sings that song? And you're going to love me. So you're going to make him love you, right? You can't make anyone love you. If they don't make the decision to love you, and you ought to just get delivered from this I don't feel loved when you don't feel loved consider the essence of God's love and the fact that love is in you uh huh see so when you don't love me I love me But loving me starts at liking me. I like me. So when, when, when you get through with your opinion about me, it changes nothing. When you get through whispering about me, it changes nothing. When you get through gossiping about me, it changes nothing. Because I, I'm the image of God. And as the image of God, I have the essence of his nature. I love me. I love me. Because he decided to love me first. It was God's essence that call, calls Adam to live. It was his nature that calls him to begin breathing. The very nature and essence of God was taken out of God and put into man. And man became another speaking spirit just like the original one, God himself. The Zoe life of God was now impacting Adam's mind and flooding him with so much wisdom Zoe life gave him the ability to operate in intelligence that wasn't even learned. He didn't learn how to name the animal kingdom. He operated out of the essence of God. He naturally had God's intelligence. Oh Lord, we think now because we've gone to school and we got three different kinds of degrees that we really know something. But you know nothing if you don't know God. Not, not anything worthwhile. 
Uh huh. If you're proud of your achievements, then you're going to be directing. It, it doesn't bother you when people really go out of the way to make sure you know that they've gone to school. So what? We have never seen a dumb generation like what we see now with doctorates. You got two doctorates, but you don't know that a man and a man shouldn't be together, and a woman and a woman, but, but you got doctorates. The animal kingdom knows better than that. Zoe life. And I need to slow down here and then I'll, I'll, I'll be finished. Zoe life was taking care of everything Adam needed. Adam's spirit is possessed with the life of God. His mind is being possessed with the life of God. He is completely 100% God conscious. At this point in creation, self is not even alive. Adam is 100% God conscience. Adam wasn't created with a self-consciousness with any need to think about or even care for himself because God's love and God's nature, God's essence was his consciousness. We get all frantic when we do good deeds and they don't return. We get bothered because we think God ain't going to do right by us. When we get a consciousness of God, we start understanding that God is always looking out for our better good. Yeah, God is never keeping any good thing from us. Tell somebody he is so good that he gives things I don't deserve to have. When you saw Adam before he sinned, Zoe supplied his life. Zoe supplied his wisdom. Zoe preserved him. And when he disobeyed God, it was in that instance that the spirit of selfishness was born. Satan came in and everything he said had to do with self. When Adam disobeyed God's word, self was born. And when self was born, it diminished the impact of Zoe, the life of God that was in Adam. Before then, Adam had no need to be concerned about himself. Adam ran the Garden of Eden with a complete 100% God consciousness and God took care of everything in him, on him, and around him. The Zoe life of God was sustaining him. When the devil shows up, the first thing he does is speaks words to get Adam and Eve to become self-conscious. When we walk around talking about nobody loves me, then it causes us to start seeking love on our own. And that's why we keep picking the wrong people. Because we're trying to find somebody to love us. Wrong move. Because if the truth be known, we are still learning what love really is. Mm, don't you go around picking your partners. Go to God. Mm-hmm. Women, he that findeth, or, or when, when a man findeth a wife, that means you hid somewhere. Go hide. What was that game we used to play when we were children? Hide. 
hiding, go seek. He can't go seek if you are hiding. Hide. Sit down somewhere. Get out of his face. And stop calling his number. Agitating him. If he wants you, he'll find you. But he'll never find you until you hide. I'm preaching right. Adam and Eve were deceived by the serpent to focus on themselves. And all of a sudden, when they became self-conscious, the glory started receding and they were now naked. When we think of that, we often think that nakedness referred to being unclothed. But as I've taught you many times before, everything in creation God put a coat on it. A dog has a coat. A cow has a coat. Cat has a coat. Amen. A bear has a coat. Adam and Eve had a coat. It was God's glory. They were dressed in God's glory. So it was not a nakedness where they were unclothed. Their clothing was God's glory. Y'all don't want to talk to me. So we see that self-consideration was not a natural tendency existing in the first man, Adam. When he lost his coat, he lost God's glory and instantly became self-conscious. Philippians 2.21 says, for all seek to advance their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Even as Christians, we are naturally self-centered. We're naturally self-indulgent. Naturally, we seek self-gratification. So, by our loving God first, totally giving ourselves over to him and becoming one heart, one will, and one soul with him, he then can fill us with his love and enable us to love others before or instead of ourselves. By me receiving God's love and loving God, I'm moving away from myself and allowing myself to be a recipient of the greatest love I could possibly receive. So the question arises, are we ever to love ourselves? The truth is that the source of real love is not within us but in God the Father God is love 1 John 4 7 through 11 beloved let us love one another for love is of God and everyone that loveth is begotten of God and knoweth God he that loveth not knoweth not God so that tells me that if I'm going to have a love relationship on the horizontal, I must learn it through my relationship with the creator of agape love. See, when I spend time with God, I learn that I'm created like him I have the capacity as he does to give myself away somebody holler the name and say won't you try it try giving yourself away but before you do that make sure you have a love relationship with God because the only way you're going to appropriately and effectively love others 
is that it starts with a love relationship with God. And guess what? I didn't choose to love him. He initiated it. He loved me first. You want to know why I love him? I love him because he initiated love toward me. And the wonderful thing about him is he would never stop loving me if I decide to stop loving him because his love is not based upon my reciprocating. He gives love away. You know why? Because he got a lot of it. God keeps giving love away because he is the total essence and nature of love. He is so much love, he can never run out of it. He can never stop loving you. Hallelujah. Can you tell somebody you are the beloved of God? The Bible said he that loveth not knoweth not God. For God is love. Herein was the love of God manifest in us that God have sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved that we go us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. This is why you must have God in you because without God in you, you possess only a natural love for yourself. And that natural love you have in you is designed for you. It caters to you. It's okay for you, but not for others. When Jesus says, I came that you might have life and have it more abundantly, he's letting you know that he came to rearrange this natural order of things so that you can become the beneficiary of the Father's love. It's only when we accept the Father's love in our lives that we get free of our natural love of self. It is only when we accept God's love for us and become filled with his love for us that we can truly love others. You're not going to be able to love someone else until you know that God loves you. You got to know it. And it's got to go beyond how you feel. It has to go beyond your, your conditions and the situations of life. We, we often measure God's love by what's happening in our lives and oftentimes, we don't even understand that out of the worst situation we could possibly encounter, God is showing us his love. If he doesn't rescue us from it at the time we think he should, he loves us so much that he gives us sufficient grace to survive it. Will you give God praise for loving you through the worst situation you have ever encountered? Can you give God praise for sustaining you? And even when he didn't heal you instantaneously, he little by little healed you and here you are the blessed of God somebody ought to give God praise for his unconditional love it is only when we accept God's love for us and become filled with his love for us that we can truly have love for others. You are not going to be able to love someone else until you know that God loves you. So there is no reason to ever love ourselves. Why? Because God has already done that. We are only to love God and others. We, we, watch this. We don't have to be concerned about whether or not we are to love ourselves. We are to love God and others. We already love ourselves naturally now now some of you might say some of you might say yeah apostle but the scripture says the one that you just read said we ought to love our neighbors 
as we love ourselves. Can I submit to you right here, give me a few more minutes, that that's not the issue. But apostle, I know some folks who don't feel good about themselves. Be careful and don't cross up the issues. You love yourself naturally is what I'm saying. But here is where the problem comes in. The problem is many of us don't like ourselves and, and that's a self-esteem issue. We, 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 we love ourselves naturally, but we don't like ourselves. What I mean is we don't like who we are. We don't like what we say. We don't like what we do. And many of us don't even like how we look. Th 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 there's a reason for that. See, when you don't like yourself and you don't like who you are and you don't like what you do and you don't like what you say, that's a very serious issue. Why? Because it's most likely all of that stuff is what you're giving away, calling it love. All the stuff you don't like about yourself, you put it in a package and give it to somebody else. If you don't want it, why do you think somebody else would want it? Do, do you ever get tired of your own sassy self? If you sassy, don't you know that your husband gets tired of you being sassy? Have you ever looked in the mirror and saw something about yourself and you said, I don't like that? I've done it a many a times. I've done it a many a times. I've looked in the mirror and I said, Bo, I don't like that. But the saddest thing is I can't change it. Unless I confess to God there's something in me that doesn't look like you. Get it out of me. Remove it from me. Deliver me. Set me free so I can be what you created me to be. Liberate me. Give me peace and joy in the midst of the greatest struggle that I'm enduring. Help me to love you first and then love others and leave it to you to love me. Uh, that's why you're so arrogant because you've been loving yourself and you learn to love your arrogance. And, and, and you... You think folks ought to just take it. Yeah. Yeah, you, you're egotistic. All you want to talk about when you get with somebody is what you've done. Please spare me that boring conversation. Because at the end of the day, ain't nothing going to pass God unless it fell into the category of God's purpose for your life and so all that stuff you bragging about that you've accomplished it might turn into fire when you stand before God because your works y'all don't want to hear me your works are going to be tried by fire and could it be that you're giving yourself credit for stuff God don't have on his book could it be that you're proud of things that you've done but God will set fire to it? Whoa! Whoa! Uh-huh. Hundreds of Christians come to church every Sunday who don't like themselves. And there are several reasons why. First reason is most of them don't value or esteem themselves. Now let me help you. Self-esteem comes from the life of God in you. And it's really not self-esteem, but it is his esteem of you. This is the issue. The issue is not whether you love yourself or not. The issue is the value you see in yourself, how much God do you really see in yourself. Because if you start looking at God in you, you could, you could never focus on the natural you like you do. The issue is how you esteem yourself. We know that we, we're not to esteem ourselves higher 
Then the word says, but how do you esteem yourself? What should your self-esteem be based upon? The, the reason why people don't like themselves and don't have a healthy self-esteem is because they don't really know experientially that God loves them. We hurt one another because we actually hurt ourselves. We drug ourselves to death. Some people have died prematurely. They, they died and didn't have to die. But they smoked themselves to death. Or they drank themselves to death. Mm -hmm. Do y'all know sometimes there are certain sicknesses that can plague your life when you spend your entire saved life being mean? You open your life to cancer and all kind of disease it's in your Bible. You live the whole entire life you being the only body right and everybody else is wrong because you love yourself. You didn't forgive. And because you didn't forgive, now unforgiveness has evolved into bitterness. Now you're bitter. You can't smile. You don't have joy. You're not happy. If you're happy, then you know it. When you don't know or not, I have not been able to identify the experience of God's love towards you, that's where the whole problem starts. When you don't know that you have experienced God's love and are experiencing his love daily, it'll affect your self-esteem. I love me because he loves me. First of all, before you become a Christian, God was taking care of you. When you was his enemy, he was taking care of you. Before you got born again, in the wrong place, with the wrong people, doing all of the wrong things. And you didn't do those things once or twice. You did those things every opportunity your flesh could get to do them. And it didn't kill you. If he took care of you before you got born again, how much more? Shout at somebody and tell them, God will take care of you. Whatever be time, God will take care of you. Turn to somebody else and with authority, remind them God will take care of you no matter what you're dealing with. No matter what's going on. It don't matter that you got yourself in that mess. It doesn't matter that you've been cycling in it for some time now. God so loved the world that includes you that he gave his only begotten son. Will you tell somebody, I can never do anything that'll take me away from the love of Christ. What can separate you you better get on your feet and say nothing ain't nothing you've done nothing you can do that will ever separate you from the love of God now he'll never stop loving you uh huh his love constrains us his love protects us. His love provides over and over and over again. Even when we mismanage, God has a ram somewhere in the bush. Somebody ought to praise God that when you ran out, didn't have any money, God showed you a ram in the bush. How many of you know 
that you went to the doctor time and time again spending money and, and if you go too often your insurance policy goes up but how about this God will heal you without an insurance policy without a health plan he's your healing he's your present help he's the lover of your soul he is the comforter somebody ought to wrap them your arms around yourself and imagine that that's God wrapping his comforting arms around you and God is taking care of you you may not see it yet maybe it hasn't manifest yet but you need to leave here today knowing that God is taking care of you it is the power of love's impact put your hands together can y'all celebrate that just for come on let's, let's celebrate a little bit more than that come on let's celebrate some more Father, we celebrate your, your love. We celebrate this Zoe life that we have in Christ. And Father, we, from this word alone, we understand that there's never a time that we are without your unconditional love. Even when you know the truth about us, even when we fail or we deliberately disobeyed, your love constrained us. Thank you for loving us. you for your expression of love hallelujah thank you father that we are coming to realize that we don't have to be self sufficient because you are supplying every need according to your riches in glory it doesn't matter what it is you, 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 you're going to take care of us. You don't slumber, nor do you sleep. You've got a purpose for every one of us. Your eyes are in every place. You know where we are. You know what we're dealing with. You know what we're facing. And you're working on our behalf. Thank you for caring for us. Thank you for loving us unconditionally. Sometimes we give you no reason, but you don't need one because the true essence of who and what you are is love. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for loving me. Thank 
thank you for covering me taking care of me thank you for keeping my body and keeping my mind thank you for a house to go to a car to drive thank you for a wife and children thank you for family and friends you've been mighty good mighty good we've complained in your face when we should have been giving praise for your goodness somebody help me just praise God for his goodness come on let's just praise God praise him for what you and I would call the little things we got up this morning and we could prepare our own selves we dressed ourselves got in our vehicles and drove ourselves to the house of God we walked in but not on our own his grace and his love has carried us and sometimes we complain more than we rejoice sometimes we miss the blessing because we are focused on self-sufficiency solving an issue when it's really not ours to solve you told us to cast every care on you why because you care for us somebody just give God praise because he's working some stuff out as you praise right now God is working things out as you worship him in the beauty of holiness he is working things out even now now open your mouth and really give him praise brother hardy will you come sir come on open those mouths and just give him praise can, can you grab the hand of that neighbor that's standing near you and the both of y'all together give praise bless the lord all oh, my soul and all that is within me bless his holy name oh magnify the lord with me and let us exalt his name together the invitation my son hallelujah let's continue